I'm in control. Well, good morning, Lighthouse. Morning. This is kind of different, ain't it? Yes. Kind of weird. Hi. Hi over here. Yeah. 
It's good. It's cool. I think it's, I think it's really fun. I, uh, when I, where I went to, cor- uh, to school at Cornerstone, our chapel was in the round like this. And it's a really cool, really different experience, right? Because Dr. Bowley over here will hear everybody else over here singing, and you'll hear them. And it's really kind of just a cool experience for us to worship together and actually feel like we're worshiping together, right? Because how often does Doug say it that circles are better than rows, right? And so that's the whole point of this morning, is to just create a little bit more of an intimate space, a space where we can, where we can worship together, hear each other, and just feel a little bit more of that community in our corporate worship today. And secondly, let me, let me say this, happy Memorial Day weekend, right? Thank you so much to all of those brave men and women and their families and their sacrifice protecting the freedoms that we have and can enjoy here in the States. And it's weird that we say happy Memorial Day, isn't it? Because Memorial Day isn't necessarily happy. It's a little more somber. It's a time where we take, it's, it's, it's a day where we take time to reflect on what was lost, right? The life that was lost in protecting what we have. But John, as John fifteen thirteen says, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. Now, we don't live in a perfect country, I understand. We still have our problems and our issues, and for some of those issues, they're pretty huge. But Memorial Day is about the men and women who gave their lives for us. And isn't that the whole reason why we're gathered here today? Because of the greatest love that was ever shown, that that loving sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Friends, it's because of Jesus that we are confronted, that when we are confronted with challenges and the odds seem stacked insurmountably against us, that we can take heart in the fact that we can get on our knees and call out to the Prince of Peace, our wonderful Counselor, our Almighty Father. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, I think, and for my family this week's kind of been a little difficult with all that's happening in our world, with all that's happened at Uvalde this last week. My heart breaks, and those feelings of anger rise up in me, anger for the injustices that's been done to these children and teachers, and fear for the future because of what about my kids one day? I'm scared. What do I do? What do I, how do I make them feel safe. And as I was sitting down to prepare for this morning, I was reminded of Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And then I looked down at the songs that we had planned almost a month ago before these events happened, and I felt God say that he wants us to go into battle. Not a physical battle with our swords and spears and fists and weapons, but he wants us to go on our knees and pray and claim victory over the evil forces in this world. So church, as we sing this first song, let's sing it it differently today. Not just as words on a page, not just a lyric, a melody that we know, but let's sing it as a prayer claiming that victory that Jesus has won for us. Claiming victory over the dark things that rule, that push against us every day. So why don't you stand as we sing. Yeah. 
Three. Mm-hmm. 
Father God, we give you praise. We give you glory in all things. God, in moments that are hard, when the darkness seems to close in, to be closing in, God, when we feel helpless, God, praise be to you. Praise be to your name. The mighty Father, our wonderful counselor, the King of kings, our, our, our warrior, God, you lead us into battle. It's you, Father. And right now, we look to you. Lead us. Give us wisdom. Give us compassion. Oh, so are you weary and trust. Oh, <laughs> 
Church, pray with me. Thank you, Father, for this beautiful song that we just sang. It's hard for us sometimes, Lord, to focus on you because there are so many things, worthless things, really, that keep us from concentrating on you. And every time we sing that or read about your face, that's just another way of saying your presence. So here we stand in your presence, Lord, asking you, to please help us to focus, to fix our eyes upon you. Because you have everything we need. We praise you this morning for the fact that Jesus Christ, for the joy that he had in his heart, went to the cross for us. Thank you, Lord. But that's not the end, because you rose. And then you went and you sat at the place of authority and power, the right hand of the Father. Yet can't even hold you there because by the Holy Spirit you're here with us today. So we come to you with praise, grateful hearts for all that you mean to us and all you've done for us. Today is a very, very important part of our weekend about Memorial Day. And we do take time to honor those who've given their lives so that we could be free. And Lord, I can't help but think about what's going on down in Texas. Because as we were told, some teachers to protect their students threw their bodies across them. And that reminds me of what you said, Lord, when you were teaching your disciples, greater love has no man than to give his life for a friend. And that you have done for us. And I pray for these parents and family members down there that they will understand that America is watching and we care and we lift them to you for your strength and comfort and peace during this difficult time and we ask Lord that you will you will just do something in our country what we need is not more government not more psychologists what we really need is a revival a turning back to God. Oh, Lord, come, please. Help us, the church, the people of God, to be what we claim to be. And part of that is being here today to worship you and to learn from you and to be challenged and blessed and helped. So in that vein, I want to lift up Pastor Kyle to you because he's going to be sharing with us in a few moments. I pray that you'll anoint him. May his words be your words. And may, Lord, all of us, right now in this moment, turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. And it's true, Lord, it's true. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glorious grace. In your precious name. Savior, wonderful 
Church, please be seated. <laughs> Happy Sunday, everybody. I, I have to do this quick poll. How many people were skeptical when you walked in this morning? <laughs> right? Like, I totally was. I'm a creature of habit. And yeah, this was pretty amazing, wasn't it? I mean, I, I agree with you. It's great being able to hear other people sing and worship together in this format. Right, is pretty cool. I'm not, I'm not advocating for every week, but I think this has been fantastic as a whole. It's almost like, Michael, like Russell Crowe, like Gladiator, right? At the end, why weren't you like, are you not entertained? <laughs> He's like, you shouldn't have done it. So uh, just a couple of quick announcements for today. And I like to walk around, so I do love this format. One is the most exciting weekend in the year for this church, which is next weekend, which is Celebration Sunday. And so we're going to have worship service inside and lunch outside, and we're encouraging everybody to bring your yard games, right? It's going to be an absolute blast. It reminds me of I grew up in the Wesleyan Church. We used to do on that Celebration Sunday like yard games and frisbee and it was just a massive church event with tons of kids so pick up a card on your way out and it'll kind of let you know what you can bring for the potluck uh the other thing i want to talk about is the varsity blood drive so this is some way that this is a way that we give back to our <coughs> community uh and this in as uh as missions month one of uh, the missions that we sponsor is missional chaplains with mike Kemple. so if we can get 25 people uh two weeks from tuesday to give blood uh, then they're going to give money back to missional church. It's a great way that you can give back to the community. And so those are the only few announcements we have for right now. If you want to enjoy and partake in the worshipful act, act of giving, there's a black boxes at the back. We encourage you to give online. And with that, I'm pumped. 
because we're so blessed with pastors at this church, right? We're so blessed. And one of the biggest blessings to our family over the past few years has been Kyle group. So I'm super pumped for your message today, Kyle. Thanks, Aaron. And I love the gladiator reference. Good morning, everyone. Kind of get set up here and uh, yeah, I know not to beat a dead horse, but um, I just want everyone to know that this was not a power play uh, on my part. It was like, oh, I get to preach. We're changing everything. Okay. This was Doug's idea. It's an experiment. And uh, I do love that we have a, a staff in a church um, uh, that is willing to try some new things and change some stuff up. So, um, and I, I am honored to, to share with you this morning. Now, as I was thinking about kind of what to preach on, I, uh, I'm the next gen pastor, and so we have kids ministry, and we do this curriculum called the Gospel Project, and so it's uh, three years through the whole Bible. We start in Genesis, we go all the way to Revelation, and every week there's some Bible story, and what I love about it is it's giving the kids that foundation of Scripture. And we just recently started back in Genesis around the beginning of the year, and so this week we are on... Uh, Exodus 32, the golden calf. And I thought, why not? I'll just preach on idolatry. Um, so uh, it's kind of cool because we are going to match up with what the kids are learning in uh, kids, kids ministry this morning. And we're going to talk about Exodus 32. Now, the, the thing with Exodus 32 is you think about idolatry, about these people in the wilderness uh, being unfaithful to God and worshiping an idol, even though God has rescued them, they are no longer in Egypt. They ha they have they're out. We we find that it's really a problem with patience. A problem with patience. Now, uh, I oh I forgot something. I have a quick announcement. Um, Nikki Douglas is needed in the lobby. Uh, for the remainder of the service. Uh, <laughs> and I say that because it's really hard to preach on patience in front of my wife because she knows that I am probably the least patient person ever. Does anyone else have a problem with patience? Let's just get it out of the way. Throw the hands up. Yep. You are a patience protester like me. I am very impatient. And it goes all the way back to being a kid. Uh, one of the things that around middle school I started to get interested in is building models. Okay, I don't know if anyone else is, a, is kind of a model person. I, I haven't done it in a long time, but when I was a kid, I would walk through the store and I would see that cool aircraft. You know, I, I did an A-10 Warthog. Um, I think I did an aircraft carrier at one point. You know, I just thought, I'm going to make that. And it had all these tiny pieces and there was process to it. And um, it was kind of like G.I. Joe on steroids, you know, and you get like a new G.I. Joe toy or something. You had to build it and put the decals on. Well, model was like grown up G.I. Joe toys. So I would try and build models. Now, I see Derek is here and I, I wanted to highlight him because this kid builds models. And if you saw a picture of some of Derek's models, you would think it was the real thing, honestly. You would, you would honestly have to look at it. We, we did a show and tell thing for youth group, and Derek brought some of his models in. And I mean, they are incredibly detailed. I think he has a couple of dioramas or, you know, I mean, just like tanks. I mean, the, you know, he, he does the wear marks on it, all of that, okay? I am not Derek Poff. Because I did not have enough patience to do a model well. And if you know the process of building a model, you know, first of all, you had to break off the piece from the little plastic hanger thing. And then if you were really good, you'd take an X-Acto knife and maybe some sandpaper and get that little, you know, hanging piece of plastic off. And then you had to paint it and, uh, or, or glue it on to wherever it would go on the model. And what would happen with me is that I would, I would glue a piece on. It would need an hour or two to set up with the glue. But was I patient enough to wait for that glue to dry? Oh, no. Oh, no. I would jump right to painting. Or I would mess with it, and I'd put a fingerprint in the glue splotch. And, you know, basically, in the end, my model just was a, 
a chunk of misshapen plastic <laughs> with drippy paint all over it, okay? If you can imagine. I just didn't have the patience to wait and to endure the process to get a good outcome. And not only was I impatient with model building, there have been a lot of scenarios over my life that I've been impatient about. Uh, many of us can look at our credit card statements and see that we are not very patient people. Maybe it's been a career choice when you, know, you had aspirations to do something significant that would maybe require a lot of schooling and you didn't have the patience um, or the perseverance to maintain to achieve that, that goal. Uh, and, and we li just live in a, a society where now is rewarded. Whether it's Amazon or you know, customer service in a store, if we have to wait, life is not good. And we will see in our passage as we turn to Exodus chapter 32 that these people who had just been rescued by God in a miraculous way and brought into the wilderness with the hope of an amazing future couldn't wait 40 days for God to give them something that would change the world, that they would be responsible for, stewards of, the law, and instead they do something completely terrible and ridiculous. And uh, I think there are some things that we as people can learn from this as well. So if you have a Bible and you want to follow along or look it up on your phone, we're going to be in Exodus 32. This is the story of the golden calf. Starting at verse 1. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. And Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out, up out of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Now, as we try and think about how this kind of thing happens, we, uh, we, have, a, we have the Bible reading to us. That's pretty cool. Uh, I have that app as well. But as we, uh, as we think about how, how the people got to the point that they're in, you know, we need to remember that they are in an uncomfortable position, okay? They are in the wilderness. They haven't been told exactly where they're going. They've been told that there is a land that, you know, a, a land flowing with milk and honey that, that the Lord will bring to them. Uh, but they've also been told that they have some war on the horizon, that God is going to remove the nations before them as, as they make their way into the promised land but they don't have they have camps but they don't really have a permanent structure or a place so they don't feel settled they're wandering they're no they're nomadic and their leader has taken off now this wasn't just like impromptu moses told them what was happening and there was this large process of of getting ready for Moses to go up to the mountain and, um, and the, the people were instructed that he would be gone for a time and that he would come back to them. But he had been gone long enough that the people just couldn't bear the waiting anymore. They became impatient. How many of you had a parent that would run an errand with you and not let you out of the car, but would say, I'll be back in just a minute. Anyone endure that lie? 
my dad would go to the hardware store or he'd stop and talk to a buddy or something like that and he's like just wait here don't turn the car off I'll be back in five minutes and I started watching the clock you know and I can I can still actually see the blue digital uh, you know timer in the car that we had and then five minutes would pass seven minutes would pass sometimes ten minutes and then as a kid especially as a young kid the anxiety level starts to increase, doesn't it? Do I go look for my dad? He told me to stay, but should I leave? What if he's in danger? And you, and you start thinking as a, as a child, should, you know, to get out of the car. And we would often have siblings uh, in there as well. And it was just, oh, and then finally you'd see him come out. And then maybe he'd like stop and like turn to talk to someone. And you'd be like, no, please just get back to the car. But when you are uncomfortable, and especially when your future is unknown, there is an anxiety that will tempt you to be impatient. It's very, very difficult to endure those things, unknown and discomfort. And to be fair to these people, Moses had been gone. He was up on the mountain for 40 days. You know, I mean, a couple hours, okay. You know, several days, getting harder. A week, whew, if you can hold on. But 40 days? You know, that's, that's longer than a month to wait. And what are you doing with your idle time? And so the anxiety can build. And, and the, the desire to know what am I supposed to be doing right now increases to the point where we try and make something happen to escape the discomfort. What's interesting is that as, as this process has built and as they, they get to that point where they can't take it anymore, they then go to justification. They know they're about to be disobedient. They know they're about to take things into their own hands. And they come up with this justification. Anyone recognize what it is in the text? As for this fellow Moses, we don't know what's happened to him. So all of a sudden, there's a little bit of blame going on that the person who has put them in, in this position is now doing wrong. This fellow Moses, you know, oh, yeah, you know, you just turned the Nile into blood, but, you know, apparently you can't find your way home, right? Moses is to blame. And he says, and they say, we don't know what's happened to him. And they admit that they are in this place of unknown. And so they take matters into their own hands. They justify themselves in doing what God had absolutely over and over told them not to do. To have no other gods before me and do not make an idol in the shape of anything in heaven or on earth. It was the number one rule. But they want something to lead them. They need something to break the discomfort of not knowing where they are to go or what they are to do. And isn't, isn't that what all of our idols are? When we make a God in our own image, and you know we're not making, at least here in America at, at this stage, we're not making little statues that we call God's. But we do have our own idols, don't we? We do have our own things that we look to, whether it's people or influencers on social media or a political party or, uh, you know, whatever it might be, our career ambitions. It's the thing that gets to tell us what to do. It's the thing that takes the anxiety out of not knowing how life is going to turn out. And so we give ourselves to these things because we'd rather at least have a false god than not be sure where the real God is. And that's really the essence of idolatry, is it's a cheap and sinful way of solving the discomfort of the challenges of life, rather than waiting on God and expecting Him to show up. And so they asked for an idol, and this is, this is just a crazy part of the story to me, that 
I guess I understand but don't understand it, how Aaron goes along with it. Aaron, who's been commissioned as the priest of God, who is, you know, given oversight over the, the temple and, and all of the sacrifices and um, who, would, who would be in charge of the, the teachers of the law. He, he goes, well, okay, give me your jewelry. And later on, he, he completely passes the buck as well. Um, we didn't read this part, but, you know, Moses is like, what did you do? And he's like, I don't know, they gave me gold and I just threw it in the fire and a calf popped out, you know? <laughs> he knows he did wrong, but he makes this idol and he goes along and then he says, we'll have a festival to the Lord. And I don't know if he's trying to say, well, you know, maybe God, this one time, if you could just inhabit this, this idol and even though the people are worshiping a statue, we'll really know, we'll, we'll think of it as you. But they have this party. So they make this idol and, and it says, they, uh, afterward they sat down to eat and drink and then got up to indulge in revelry. And that line to me really reveals to me the heart of the people. That behind their anxiety and behind their not knowing was really just a sinful desire for their own passions and comfort. That really they just, it was hard to be in the desert. And they wanted a reason to party. So rather than being reverent and somber in worship, they they get up and they're dancing and they're doing all the stuff that they took with them from Egypt and had seen for hundreds of years. It certainly didn't lead to godliness. And then later Moses will come down and uh, it, it's a bad deal when dad comes home. <laughs> the tablets get smashed. Aaron gets a talking to uh, Levites are, are called up and, and respond to Moses' call and uh, basically people who are dancing and partying in, in this, uh, this wild debauchery are slaughtered as a consequence. Um, and it's, it turns to mourning. And of course, like our impatience isn't always going to turn into that. It's not going to turn into some you know, dire thing where you know, God uh, sees fit to punish us in such, a, such an extreme way. But can't we identify the negative consequences that have come from our impatience? Can't we see how we mess things up when we don't wait on God? And maybe it's just, maybe it's not a direct negative consequence, but maybe it's just a forfeiting of the good that God had planned for you. I think, I think as I look back on, on certain decisions that I've made in my life, that's one of the hardest to grieve. Is like, what could have been if I'd just been a little bit more patient? What, what could have been if I had just waited? What it's hard to wait. So what's the opposite of this? What should the people have done and, and what should we do? Instead of being impatient and instead of trying to solve our own problems, what does it look like to be patient and to wait on the Lord? Well, I think it means just that. It means waiting on the Lord. And patience will always be difficult for you if you take your eyes off of God. And as I think about this story, you know, Moses is up where? On the mountain, Mount Sinai. Does anyone know, if you remember the story, what was happening on top of Mount Sinai as Moses ascended? What's that? Well, the burning bush was before, so that's how Moses got commissioned. Good, but we're on the right track, burning. So there was a cloud, the glory of God settled on the mountain, and it says as the people looked up, it looked like there was fire over the mountain. And this is so cool, I, I gotta not get distracted here, but um, there's, there's actually a documentary called The Mountain of God, In Search of the Mountain of God. And there is a mountain in Arabia that is covered in black obsidian, two to three inches thick. Obsidian is a geological formation that is only made through extreme heat. 
but it is only this mountain that has this obsidian, and it is not volcanic. And all the local people know it as Mount Moshe, the mountain of Moses. And it looks like there's a constant shadow on the mountain because it is dark on the top. And so, you know, the, the proposal of this documentary is that that is Mount Sinai. That is where the fire of God descended to the top of the mountain and the heat was so intense that it uh, turned the, the top layer to obsidian. Is that crazy? Now, the people are, are down. They can't approach the mountain. That was, it was, there was a boundary and these 12 pillars and markers and everything, but they can't approach it. But they could see that something was happening on the mountain. So if they have forgotten God, what must they have done? They're not looking at the mountain anymore. It had become commonplace or forgettable or like whatever in the span of, of time, but they took their eyes off of, off of God and what he was doing and just looked at their present circumstances. And as soon as you take your eyes off of God, you will find something, an idol to make for yourself. So patience is simply waiting on God. It's, it's trusting that he has your good in mind and that even if it's not happening right now, it will happen. It's coming. So your job is to do what he's told you to do in the present until he shows up and gives you a new direction. That is waiting on the Lord. And as you do that, basically what you're doing is you are refusing to let discomfort be your boss. You are putting God in his rightful place. And you are acknowledging that the present discomfort is not going to compare with the future blessing. But if you take your eyes off of God, then your discomfort and your anxiety and your difficult position then begins to direct you. And that's where you slip up and make mistakes. Because our present conditions are terrible bosses. Secondly, when you're patient, as I mentioned, you're trusting in God's goodness. You are remembering that God is a good God who defined himself as complete love. And even though everything on this earth and in this life is not always easy, and there is tragedy, in the end, he's good. In the end, he's not trying to ruin you. He is with you. And he loves you. And he himself is patient. And this is so cool. God, in his name, when he defines himself as Yahweh, he describes himself as slow to anger. Which is another way of saying patient, isn't it? God is patient with us. God looks at us and all of our mistakes and our foibles and our lack of faith and our inability to figure it out and, and learn the lesson and he gives us another chance. He's like, okay, we'll try again. Now there's, there are times when he decides to intervene and thinks that's best for you and introduce some consequences, but oftentimes we don't get what we deserve. And it's because of God's patience. Paul, in talking about love, what's the first aspect of love that he gives us in 1 Corinthians 13, 4? Love is patient. How ma many of you know that verse, you have it memorized, the whole love thing, but how quickly do we skip over love is patient? That's not usually what I think of when I think of love. But love is patient. If you love God, You'll be patient with him. Knowing that he's trying to work out something good. And, and that, that to me is another thing. When we talk about how patience benefits us. When you are patient with other people and especially with God. You're giving them room to love you back and bless you. 
I know that there have been times when, because of my impatience, I have short-circuited someone else's plans to do good for me. Have you ever, have you ever been there? Maybe with a kid or something like that, you told a child, like, wait, you know, we're, we'll get to it, you know, we'll, we'll do something, and then they end up going and doing something anyway, which is way worse than what you had planned, but, you know, now you, you can't really give them the thing that they wanted because, anyone been there? You know what I'm talking about? Maybe it's waiting for a promotion or, you know, something that, some relationship, and because you couldn't wait, You derailed that person's good plans for you. And that's something that happens with our relationship with God. Patience creates space for relationship and teamwork. You know, there's that that phrase, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. But if you go with other people, you got to go to, you got to wait for others to come around. And then the last thing, and I'll end with this, because uh, there's a beautiful psalm that just really summarizes what we're talking about. Doug will like this, because it's a U2 song. Um, psalm 40, right? Psalm 40. Uh, the last thing that patience does for us is that it leads to and is sustained by authentic prayer when life is hard and you don't see the way out and you're wondering what to do the only way that you really will get through it and stay obedient is if you are reaching out to God in the process and so many of the Psalms give us beautiful examples of people who are in the midst of waiting life has gotten hard life has gotten difficult and they want out It's not like they just suddenly get this super character and they love pain and, you know, they can suffer. No, they want it to end. But at their best, they're unwilling to step out in disobedience to try and solve their pain. Instead, they go to God and they give God their troubles and their anxieties and then they wait for him. And this is what we see in Psalm 40. It begins, I waited patiently for the Lord. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. Now what's interesting about that start is it's in the past tense. It's like it's already done. It's already happened. He turned to me and he heard my cry. But then as we read through the psalm, it seems like, I don't know. It sounds like you still have a lot going on. So it's... It's either he's recalling times in the past when God has been faithful and that's giving him strength to wait in the present or it's like a future I know that he hears me. And I'm going to say it like it's already done because I know that I can trust God. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see in fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not look to the proud. And notice what he's doing here. He's like, we have all these solutions that we can look to besides God. But blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders you have done. The things you plan for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. He goes on for a while. And he says, uh, he ends with this, Yet I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Oh my God, do not delay. I waited patiently for the Lord and he heard my cry. But then he ends with, Oh God, do not delay. Isn't that beautiful? And isn't it a reminder of of how we should be as we wait on the Lord? He's going to come through. He will absolutely come through. But God, don't take too long. (laughs) 
because I don't know if I can hold on. But if you're authentically reaching out to him, if you're going to him with, with your worry and your weakness, he will show up and he will answer that prayer. I think a good way to ask the question of ourself is, are you strong enough to do nothing? Are you strong enough to do nothing? Do you have the character and the trust to just sit there and wait for God to show up? Now that's not to say that there aren't times for movement and there aren't times to make a decision and and get moving, especially when we're talking about protecting people or, you know, but so often in our life, you know, just like the people, at the bottom it's really just about what we want. It's not about others. It's not about God. We just want a reason to party. And so it gets really hard to be patient. But if we can wait on the Lord, he will come through. He will come through. I want to just uh, end with this and and ask you, um, I know that a lot of times our church services are are, uh, just kind of entertainment. I mean, not entertainment, but, you know, we come and just expect to, to listen or whatever, but I I would ask you to engage here at the end. And I want you to think of something that is difficult for you right now. And especially in terms of just waiting for God to give you an answer. So what, what's going on right now in your life? A relationship, a job situation, a, you know, maybe it's just something internal to you that no one else knows about. But you know you don't have an answer and it's difficult to sit there in it. And you are tempted to solve it yourself rather than wait for God to show up. Would you right now, in the next 60 seconds or so, would you simply, in your own mind and heart, tell God what that is and ask him for some help to wait until he gives you an answer? Very simple, very easy, and it's just a start. Let's take about a minute to do that right now. Father in heaven, uh, we worship you and praise you and thank you that you are a God who cares for us and loves us very much. And Lord, we admit our weakness, especially in terms of being patient and waiting on you. Um, God, I I confess that uh, patience is not my virtue. But Lord, forgive us for our lack of faith Forgive us for our lack of trust in you and forgive us for our, our, our sinful desires that lead us to, uh, to want to take things into our own hands and, and not be patient. I pray for those of us who have big decisions or are in a period of waiting and don't see the end in view, God. Would you please strengthen us in a supernatural way so that We do not create our own idol, but instead we keep our eyes on you. And we wait for you. We wait for the proper time. We leave space for other people to be involved in our lives and uh, and bless us. And Lord, we look forward to the blessing that you have for us as we walk in obedience. Lord, whatever people uh, mention today, I just ask that you would meet them in that thing, that you would show them the good that you have for them, and that you'd give them the the strength to persevere. And and where we are weak, Lord, I pray that this would be the kind of church where we could rely on each other and depend on each other in our times of waiting so that we don't do it alone. But we're there to encourage one another and help each other see, uh, see it through. 
love you, God. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he patiently endured the cross, not ending it too soon, but seeing it all the way through to the end and eventually rising out of the tomb. And it's that love and that hope that we need to put our, to our trust in. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, won't you stand? great Lord we wait patiently for you for your direction because it's ultimately your breath that we breathe not our own it's yours so let us wait patiently Lord for your revival let us be vessels for your revival God come move fill us call us to what you have
your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's great today for the Sunday to know that we worship the one true God and amazing a great God and a God even those times when we're waiting on him he has nothing but good intentions for us and that may be difficult at times to understand but he has nothing but good intentions for us and desires a relationship with us and that is amazing and so I was talking to Pastor Doug just a little bit about next week, and I touched on it briefly, you know, the Celebration Sunday, and it's so much more than just a time for us to get together as a family and have a potluck, right? This is the time of year that, this is the day of the year that we really just celebrate all the goodness God has poured out on us, our church, our church body, and us to communicate and reach our community as a whole and also celebrating, looking forward to everything he's going to do. And so wrapped up in that is initiation of new members. It's also, as Pastor Doug likes to say, the Super Bowl, right, of the church, which is baptisms, right? So it's going to be amazing times. So I encourage you to show up, bring your entire family, the, the, the meat, the, you know, hot dogs and hamburgers and drinks, all that's going to be provided. You know, grab a little card on your way out. If you have the opportunity to bring something for the potluck, that would be amazing. But next week, it's just going to be fantastic. It's going to be fantastic. And so now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours now and forever. Amen. Everybody go in peace. We'll see you next weekend.